Sure. Uh, so I've been in uh, biotech and molecular diagnostics for about 20 years. Um, I uh, started a molecular diagnostics company that was uh, primarily backed by Johnson & Johnson. I ran that for about a decade, sold it, uh, was involved in a number of uh, uh, different uh, biotech ventures and uh, public boards. Uh, I eventually met uh, Dr. Valdemar Prebe, our founder, uh, who's a professor of medicinal chemistry at MD Anderson and an expert on um, anthracyclines, uh, which is uh, the class of drugs that contains our lead compound, berubicin. And I got uh, really excited about this possibility of a new treatment for glioblastoma, which is one of the most difficult cancers to treat um, of any cancer. And uh, that was about three and a half years ago. And, uh, and since then, uh, we've taken the company public on the NASDAQ, uh, the ticker is CNSP. And uh, as you said at the beginning, we uh, submitted uh, to uh, FDA a, uh, an IND uh, application to study berubicin uh, in a randomized controlled study uh, for recurrent GBM, for which there is currently no uh, approved therapy anywhere in the world. So we're quite, uh, we're quite excited uh, to get started. It's a, it's a really interesting molecule. Um, you know, I'll say something that uh, a lot of CEOs uh, might not say, which is uh, in many ways, there's nothing novel about berubicin. Berubicin is an anthracycline. So this is a class of drugs um, that has been around for 60 years. It's a first line therapeutic for all kinds of uh, different uh, cancers from breast cancer, lung cancer, ovarian cancer, you know, you, you name it. Uh, anthracyclines are used to treat these, uh, these cancers. They're very potent poisons, um, been in use for a long time, well-established toxicity and side effect profile, dosing regimens, everything. I like to say, you know, there's not an oncologist in the world that doesn't know how to use an anthracycline. So what's the trick with berubicin? Well, anthracyclines typically don't get across the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier is this very specialized network of uh, endothelial cells that surround our brain and basically keep uh, harmful substances out of, of the brain for obvious reasons. So uh, most uh, chemotherapy drugs are, are sort of on the do not admit list, if you will, uh, for the blood-brain barrier. And anthracyclines uh, historically have, have been no-go. They, they simply don't pass. So what Dr. Prebe did um, was a type of innovation that is just I think it's so elegant and it's what really uh, got me excited and, and, and why I came to the company because what he did was he essentially combined this very tried and true class of drugs that everybody understands, you know, payers, regulators, clinicians, they all know how to use these drugs. But he made a very simple modification to uh, a sort of uh, base anthracycline monocle. He started with a drug called doxorubicin, which is a uh, very commonly known and used anthracycline. And he added, um, you know, to get a little technical, he, he added a benzyl group uh, to the glycone ring of this molecule. And in so doing, he made it a highly lipophilic, which means it's got an affinity to a lipid fat rich environment. And our brain is the most lipid environment in the body. And so that simple modification allows this molecule that without it would be stopped by the blood-brain barrier to actually cross the blood-brain barrier very efficiently. It gets into the brain, and now here's the, the, the really cool part. When it's in the brain, it's going to do what every other anthracycline does. In this case, it's an inhibitor of an enzyme called topoisomerase 2. That's an enzyme that basically cleaves the double helix of DNA as part of the unwinding process when a cell replicates. Now, in the adult brain, we don't have a lot of rapidly dividing cells normally. But if you've got a cell in the brain that's rapidly dividing, it's probably a tumor cell, like a GBM cell. It's going to overexpress this enzyme uh, that berubicin is designed to inhibit. So not only is it going to cross the blood-brain barrier, but you're going to have selective uptake into cell that we want to destroy. So berubicin then is a very potent inducer of apoptosis. It's a very potent inhibitor of cell growth. It's a very efficient molecule because it, it crosses the blood-brain barrier in high concentrations. So we don't have to flood the body with this poison in order to get just a little bit into the brain. We can basically give it in a very low dose, um, which limits its toxicity and side effects, gets into the brain, and then it acts just like a, a molecule that oncologists are familiar with 
for six decades. And I love that because, you know, in my 20 years, what I found is that sometimes the hardest uh, distance to cross in bringing innovation to the clinic is the last half mile. When you're talking about rank and file clinicians who are sitting there in the exam room and they have to make a decision with their patients, you know, people who don't have much time left if they have GBM. Uh, what am I going to give this patient versus everything else? And in my estimation, if you're that clinician and you've got a choice and you're going to say, well, I have an opportunity to give them something that looks and behaves and acts and has side effects, just like something that I've been working with my whole career, except it gets into the brain, I'm probably going to do that. Um, this drug had very exciting data in the um, phase one. 44% um, of patients received a clinical benefit of, of stable disease or better, um, which is one of the gold standards in GBM. Uh, three patients had their tumors shrink. One patient actually uh, is still alive today, 14 years after treatment with Berubicin uh, and cancer-free from, uh, from a documented case of GBM, and that's almost unheard of. So uh, we're very excited to begin enrolling patients uh, early part of next year uh, in this study. Yeah, so it's going to be a uh, multi-center uh, randomized controlled study. We'll be randomizing against lamustine, which is uh, the current standard of care for recurrent GBM, although that drug is not approved for that use, which I think speaks you know, kind of volumes about just how bad the landscape is for GBM patients when you have to use unapproved drugs as the standard of care. But we'll be randomizing against that. Um, we're probably looking in the neighborhood of uh, around 250 patients. Uh, we expect interim analysis in the uh, first uh, part of 2022. Uh, but one of the interesting things about uh, our company is we have a, a terrific partnership uh, with a company in Poland, WPD Pharmaceuticals. They are a sub-licensee for Eastern Europe, and um, they received a $6 million grant from the EU to conduct uh, two uh, clinical studies of berubicin, one in a pediatric population with brain cancer, and another, uh, basically a mirror study uh, of berubicin in adults. And that will be an open label study. And so we actually expect interim data from that study as soon as the third quarter of 21. So fairly rapid, uh, you know, potential data uh, for a study of, of this kind. And we're expecting a pretty rapid patient accrual in Poland because uh, there's not another competing study in the entire country of 50 million people uh, in GBM. And every single center that treats recurrent GBM in Poland is a site uh, for that study. So we expect them to enroll rapidly. It's the exact same patient population, same drug supply, same dosing, same CRO, same database, the whole deal. So the data that we see coming from Poland uh, really will be a very advanced look for investors at how Berubicin is behaving in our study population in the U.S. here. Yeah, that's a great uh, question. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a heavy question uh, for me. Um, you know, I've been, uh, I've been with CNS uh, for three and a half years. Uh, almost every single person that uh, contacted the company um, uh, in the first couple of years of our existence about when they might be able to try Berubicin either as part of a trial or a compassionate use, uh, they've all passed away. Uh, this is a just an absolutely devastating disease. In fact, you, you know, I, I used to wonder when I started uh, with the company, why for an orphan disease that only affects 15,000 people, why was it that as soon as I told people what I was doing, everybody seemed to have a story about somebody they knew that had GBM. And then it finally dawned on me uh, that, you know, if, if your aunt's uh, sister's cousin's boss got breast cancer, you probably didn't hear about it because she probably got better. But if that same person got GBM, you probably did hear about it because she died. Because almost everyone dies. Um, almost everyone relapses and eventually um, this cancer will, will kill you. So, you know, to answer your question, what I think is, you know, we can provide hope, um, which is a very powerful weapon uh, in oncology. Uh, we can provide hope that there may be a drug out there at some point uh, called berubicin that has curative potential. 
certainly could extend uh, progression-free survival and extend overall survival. And when you're talking about a disease where the median survival is between 14 and 16 months, even a matter of months is, uh, is material. So we believe uh, that this combination of, again, a tried and true class of therapeutics that's so well known and understood and so potent against so many cancers um, can move the needle in this disease. And, and one of the other, I think, really exciting things about it is, think about this, you know, 15,000 people a year get GBM, but more like 150,000 patients um, contract metastatic brain cancer from breast or lung cancer, all these common metastatic pathways to the brain. And once those cancers get into the brain, they have the same challenges uh, that a GBM patient does with a primary diagnosis. That is, we've now got cancer in the brain, it's inside the blood-brain barrier, how are we gonna treat this? And that's where Barubison, I think, opens up a whole potential avenue of hope for lots of patients who are dealing with very difficult cancers that perhaps they weren't caught or cured uh, when they were at their original organ situs, and now, um, now they can be. And that was really Dr. Prebe's uh, mission when he, uh, when he set out uh, to create a drug uh, like Barubison, and that was to create what he calls an organ-targeted therapeutic. This molecule was designed specifically to get into the brain. And I think what he wanted to do was set aside the mechanism of action problem and say, if I could take something that we know works in the test tube against GBM cells, we know it works against all sorts of other cancers, uh, but if I can modify it to get it into the brain, I have a game changer. And, and that's what we've got.